Will you pray with me as we get started today? Jesus, we pray today that we would be open to what you have to say to us, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, that you would open our lives to what you have to say and what you want to do in us as we look at these questions that you ask. Jesus, we are grateful for your grace that meets us in this place and all the things that you want to do in us and through us. So Jesus, we pray these things in your name today. Amen. Amen. Well, hi, friends. <laughs> if I have not gotten to meet you yet, my name is Mindy Moore, and I'm the campus pastor at our Midtown campus, which means that most weeks I am there. I am not here, but I'm so excited to be here at our North Indy campus and with our online community, getting to keep looking at this series, The Questions Jesus Asked. So it's interesting as someone who has gotten to preach every week of this series at our Midtown campus, these questions have kind of messed me up a little bit. I don't know about you, but these are good, difficult, faith-shaping questions. And so I have loved this series. I hope that you have too if you've been with us. And if you haven't been with us, if it's your first time you're just walking in, today's a good one too. <laughs> so today's question that we're looking at is Jesus' question, who do you say I am? Who do you say that I am? Now, when Jesus asked this question to his disciples, he has this conversation with them. It's kind of a two-part conversation. So the first question he asked the disciples is actually not who do you say I am, but it's what are people saying about me? Jesus knows that people are talking about him, and he wants to know, well, okay, then what are they saying? But the thing is, people weren't just talking about Jesus then. People are talking about Jesus now. I want to show you a still picture from an ad that is running right now and got a lot of momentum during the Super Bowl. How many of you have seen this ad? He gets us. Okay, quite a few of you. And the reason is because a group of people paid $20 million for people to talk about Jesus over Wings, Beer, and Rihanna. <laughs> Woohoo! Exactly. It's a great conversation. I hope you had it at your Super Bowl party. The fact is, this question still matters today because people are still talking about Jesus. And so for me, I wanted to know, okay, if people are talking about Jesus, what are the people in my real life saying? So this past week, I went on my social media, and I just put it out there. I said, hey, this is what I'm preaching on this week. I would love to know how you would answer the question of who you say Jesus is. And here are some of the responses that I got. Lord, comforter, mentor, teacher, friend, love, son of God, a great spiritual leader, my hope and grace. And so today, as you listen to this message, if you're someone who takes notes, it's okay if you don't, but if you're someone who takes notes, or if you're in the chat, I want to invite you just to jot down the word or phrase that comes to your mind when you hear this question. Who do you say that I am? How would you answer that question about Jesus? Because I think a lot of how we answer this question can be based on the things that we know and the things that we've experienced. Even if you're someone that you're like, I'm not super religious or I haven't been around church a lot. The fact is, most of us know who Jesus is and we have some kind of opinion about this person. So what do you say? Who do you say that Jesus is? Now, we say this come up in the first response that the disciples give Jesus when he says, okay, what is everyone else saying? They give some pretty predictable answers. They say, people are saying you're like Elijah, you're like Jeremiah, maybe you're a great prophet. And these answers make sense. They're not wrong answers, but they're also not quite right. Because these answers don't tell the full story of who Jesus is. They don't really give a complete picture of what Jesus did or why he was there. I mean, he was a prophet. He was a great teacher, but he was also so much more than those simple things. 
And I think for Jesus, just as we look at this conversation, I want to be really clear that for Jesus, this conversation is not like an ego boost for him. He is not fishing for compliments. He's not trying to be like, disciples, tell me how great I am. Tell me how holy. No, that's not what he's doing here. What Jesus is doing while he's having this conversation is because for Jesus, for all the things that people are saying, for all the opinions that might be out there, it really matters to him what these 12 people believe, what these 12 disciples would say in answer to this question. Because these 12 people have had an experience that no one else has truly had. They have witnessed things. Jesus has invested time in them. They have decided to give up everything that they knew willingly just to follow him. And so there was something about being that close to Jesus that should have changed this group of people and how they were living their lives. And so what Jesus does with them is he basically takes them away. He gets them out of the noise and the busyness of their everyday lives so that they can have this really critical conversation with each other. William Barclay, in his commentary on the passage, he says it's like Jesus took the disciples on a spiritual retreat. Now, how many of you have ever been on a spiritual retreat? Here's my favorite thing about a spiritual retreat. They are normally somewhere in the country, and you don't get any cell service. (laughs) They're great. You get away from all of the stuff that is distracting, all of the noise, all of the things that keep us from hearing what God has to say, and you just get to focus. And I think Jesus knew that if they were going to have this kind of conversation, that was the kind of focus that they needed. They needed to pay attention in a different way. But what I really love about this imagery of a spiritual retreat is that it reminds me of what we do in the church during Lent. Now, there might be some of us in this space that you have already gone on your spiritual retreat or you've got it planned. But here's the thing, you don't actually have to get away. The awesome thing about the season of Lent in the church is that we take 40 days and we say we are going to pay attention to our faith in a way that we don't do any other time of the year. I mean, here at St. Luke's, what do we do? We say, I'm going to get in a small group, even if I'm not a people person. I'm going to hang out with people and talk about my faith. We do that for five weeks because it matters. We ask different questions. We serve in different ways. We walk the stations of the cross because we say our faith matters. And we know that sometimes we have to take a little extra time to let it matter more. And I think when we're in that kind of space, when we can be open to what God's telling us, what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives, Jesus can do a lot with a space like that. Jesus can do a lot when we are open in that kind of way. And I really do believe that it matters to Jesus how we practice our faith. I think Jesus cares a lot about what's going on in our faith life. And I would even say that I think it's just as important to Jesus how we answer this week's question as it was to how the disciples answered it back then. Because look, we are the church. We are the witness of Jesus to the world. We have experienced things about Jesus that should change us, that should shape us. And the way we answer this question has the power to shape every single thing about our lives. Now, I think we have to be a little bit careful when we look at this week's question in particular. Because the temptation with this question is to let it be a thought exercise. I mean, you jotted the thing down in your notebook or your notes app or you put it in your chat. You're like, hmm, yes, I do believe this about Jesus. That's great. This is what I think. It's all in my head. But I think what Jesus wants to do is Jesus wants to take it out of our heads and into our lives. Jesus cares about what we do. It's not just about what we think or we claim. And if we really give attention to our answer to this question, I think our answers have the potential to kind of mess our lives up in a really holy way. You know, one of my favorite quotes I've ever heard about Jesus comes from a book by Shane Claiborne called The Irresistible Revolution. Now, this book is, it came out when I was in college, and that has been longer than I would like to tell you from this stage. So it's been a minute since this book came out, but this quote has stuck with me. He says, 
the more I get to know Jesus, the more trouble he seems to get me into. I don't know if you've had that experience, but I think I have. And as we really get to know Jesus, it does something to us. It does something to our lives. It does something to the way that we navigate the world around us. And when we find ourselves with a compelling answer to this question of who do we say that Jesus is, all of a sudden it gets really hard to play it safe. All of a sudden it gets hard to just sit on the sidelines of our faith and watch things happen. Jesus starts to bring us into this place of action. And I think this question that Jesus asked this week It also comes with an invitation and a challenge. What will we do about the things that we say we believe? What will we do about the things we say we believe? Now, I think maybe it's this undercurrent of action in this question that makes Peter the perfect person to answer back. So I said Jesus asked two questions in this passage, right? What are people saying about me? But now he's moving to the more personal. He's saying, okay, you said what everyone else thinks, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And I love that Peter answers this because I don't know if you have a favorite disciple, but I do, and it's Peter. I love Peter. Peter is so relatable to me because he's impulsive. He's a little snarky sometimes. He's very bad at following the rules when he needs to. He is just kind of all over the place, and yet he is so close with Jesus. And it's this normal, relatable person that when Jesus asks this question, he looks right back at Jesus, and he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Friends, that is a powerful statement. That is a bold statement. Because with that answer, now Jesus isn't just some run-of-the-mill prophet. Jesus isn't just some teacher. He's not just a nice guy who does nice things for people. With that answer, Peter is saying here, Jesus, you are different. We have never experienced someone like you before. We've never seen what you've come to do. We've never known anyone like you. And as Peter answers this question, he gives Jesus this title, the Christ, which means the anointed one. And I think what Peter is saying here is that even if he doesn't understand everything that this title brings with it, even if he doesn't have a full theological understanding of this big statement he's making, what he knows is that he's committing, and he knows that Jesus, that knowing Jesus changes things for him. Knowing Jesus changes things for Peter. And I don't want you to miss that this is a very risky thing for Peter to do and say. Even in the little spiritual retreat environment, even with his best friends, it's a risk because he is saying something that no one else is saying. I mean, Peter is taking this box that people have Jesus in, and he is just blowing it up. He is saying, Jesus, I see something in you that no one else is saying, but I want to have a faith that is big and bold and real, even if it doesn't look like the faith that anyone else around me has. That's who I'm going to be. And I know, I know for a fact, there are people here in this room and online today that you have felt in that place with your faith too, where your faith does not line up with the models or the examples around you. I think there's a couple kinds of ways that this can express itself. First of all, there are some of you that faith is not something that most people around you have, maybe in your social group, in your family. The fact that you call yourself a Christian feels really weird to a lot of people that you know. And so you're trying to figure it out and say, how do I do this? How do I grow in my faith? How do I live like Jesus when I don't have a super clear roadmap? or a lot of examples. But then I think there's another group where it's not that you're the only one with faith. It's just that your faith doesn't look like it's supposed to. There's a group of us that our faith started out in this one place where there was a lot of certainty. 
It was very simple. We had all the answers. It was very clear. And then something happened in our stories and it blew it up. It doesn't work anymore. And so you've had doubts, you've had questions, you've had deconstruction, and now maybe you're over here and you're like, yeah, my faith is good, but I don't know how to reconcile it with that thing I knew in the past. And I don't know how to talk to the people in my past or in my life who it doesn't match up with. I think for some of us here today, the biggest risk we feel with our faith is just the fact that we showed up here. Just the fact that we're trying to work things out with a community and trying to figure out maybe what God is doing in our lives. And so I just hope you know that no matter where your faith journey is, maybe it looks like those two examples, maybe it looks totally different, but wherever you are, we don't have to have it all worked out for God to be working in us. We don't have to have it all worked out for God to be working in us. And I'm just going to say, if you're in a place where you're like, well, I do have it all worked out, give it about 10 minutes. <laughs> it's going to change. So remember that, that when you feel like your questions are so big or you can't see the way ahead, God is still at work. Because the power of our faith and the commitments that we make, it's not having the right answer. I think it's just being willing to try to answer the question in the first place. And saying yes to letting Jesus take us wherever he wants to go, no matter what questions or uncertainties we bring with us. You know, I think some of the most powerful commitments that we make as people, we have no idea what we're getting into. I mean, I want you to think about what happens in this very room many times a year, mostly in the summer. People get married. People get married. And look, as someone who has been married for almost 13 years and whose spouse is in the room, so I gotta be careful, um, I'll just tell you, we had no idea what we were committing to when we got married. You just don't. I mean, you stand in front of people, you make vows, you commit to this wonderful person, and then like three weeks later, you realize you didn't just marry the wonderful person, but you married their weird habits. You married their taste in music. You married the fact that when they go to get something from the cabinet, they leave the cabinet open after they got that thing. <laughs> and then after a while, you realize that people in their family do that too, and now you've had children and your children do that. So I don't know how to break the cycle <laughs> of the cabinet opening. We can talk about that later afterwards. <laughs> but here's the point. Our commitments no matter what the unknown comes with. And look, it can be marriage, it can be a job, it can be a move, it can be a change in your life, fill in the blank. But our commitments, when they have an unknown or uncertainty to them, it doesn't lessen the power of the commitments that we make. And I think that's true in life, but it's especially true with Jesus. Because as much as we're able to commit to Jesus, Jesus takes his commitment to us to just this totally different level. I mean, look at what he says to Peter after Peter has made this beautiful statement about who Jesus is. He says right back to him, I tell you that you are Peter, and I'll build my church on this rock. The gates of the underworld won't be able to stand against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and anything you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. Anything you loosen on earth will be loosened. In heaven. And what we've got to understand here is that when Jesus tells Peter that he's the rock, that he's the foundation, do you know what Peter does? He messes it up. He messes it up. Keep reading scripture. Come back on Good Friday and you can hear it in Peter's own words. This person that said, You are the Christ, a few weeks later he says, I don't know the man. I don't know him. He has done a total 180 in who he says that Jesus is. But here is the amazing thing. Even though Peter, who he says Jesus is, can be shaky sometimes, who Jesus says Peter is, that doesn't change. How Jesus sees us is not dependent on our mistakes, on our failures, on when we get it wrong. In fact, there is this beautiful story in John 21 where we see just how constant Jesus can be in the way that he loves us. 
Now, this story in John happens after Jesus' death and resurrection. It kind of ties up this narrative of the disciples and Jesus. And to me, it begins with what are some of the saddest words in all of Scripture. It begins with Peter saying, I'm going fishing. Now, that sounds a little weird on the outset. Like, fishing is fine. I'm not anti-fishing here. But it's sad to me because what Peter did before he met Jesus is he was a fisherman. That's where Jesus found him. And now we are after all of these things that happened. And it's like in this moment, this person who declared all these amazing things about Jesus is right back where he started. And when I read this, I'm left wondering, Peter, did any of the things that you said you believed, did they change a single thing about your life? But I told you it's a beautiful story. Because then Jesus shows up. And three times he and Peter have this conversation over and over again. And three times Peter denied Jesus. So it's this beautiful mirror of what has happened. And the conversation goes like this. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. To which Jesus replies, then feed my sheep. And if I could paraphrase this conversation a little bit, I might put it this way. Peter Remember who you said I am. Now remember who I say that you are. And remember what this means for how you live your life. Remember. Because no matter what has happened, no matter how bad things have gotten or how far away from Jesus Peter feels, The fact is he is not the same person as he was before he met Jesus. Knowing Jesus, following Jesus, being loved by Jesus has changed him. It's changed him and it's given him a different purpose because of who he says Jesus is. And I think the question for us today, because it's not just a story about Peter, it's a story about us, is, is the same thing true? Is who we say Jesus is changing who we are and how we live? Is our relationship with Jesus bigger than a belief system and more a way of life? Or is it just something we let live up here? I know that this is a heavy question. I know this is a question that invites us to maybe look at some parts of ourselves that we're not super comfortable with, or we want to change. But I think the tension of this conversation we're having today is that Jesus wants who we say he is to shape everything. And I'm talking about our whole actual lives, not just the parts that feel easy or accessible or fit between the meetings on my calendar in that little white space. Like, Jesus wants all of it, even the parts that feel difficult to give, even the things that are scary. Because I think that letting Jesus shape all of who we are, it's not easy, but it's absolutely worth it. It might make us uncomfortable. It might get us into a little trouble, like Shane Claiborne says. But it also might open up some really holy things in our lives. It might change our relationships. It might change our marriages, the way we parent, our friendships, the way that we relate to the people at work. It might change the way we spend our time and our money. It might change so much of how we're oriented to the world. I know it did for Peter because he let Jesus change all of him, and he went from being a fisherman to the foundation of the church. And what happened to Peter, it was personal but it wasn't private. What happened to him didn't just change his insides, it changed what happened in the world around him. And I think that can be true for us too. I think as the church, it has to be true for us too. It matters that we let this question of Jesus shape who we are and how we exist in the world. You know, we're gonna close today by singing a song that I just love because it reminds me that no matter who we are, no matter what our faith looks like, no matter where we find ourselves, that God is at work. And so I don't know where you find yourselves. I don't know how this question lands for you today. 
But I would just invite you as we sing this last song to just be open to what God might have to say.